I guess we'll uh, get started. We're going to be talking about the state of Ajax. We're going to go on a little bit of a whirlwind tour of kind of things that have uh, happened and where things are going right now. Uh, my name's Dion Almer, um, born in London. Uh, unfortunately, didn't get to be anywhere interesting for uh, Euro this year. And uh, unlike some of the Brits that like to talk about that 5-1 defeat, I understand uh, what really matters. And you, know, you guys have many more World Cups, so uh, I envy you very much. I work with uh, Google Code and uh, developer APIs, uh, primarily open web kind of stuff. So things like Gears, I'll be talking about Gears uh, later on in the day and kind of going through all of those different APIs. I also run a blog kind of uh, in my spare time called Ajaxian. Uh, has anyone here been to ajaxian.com before? Okay, cool, does well in Germany. So yeah, that's where we talk about all the kind of Ajax uh, goodness and things that are happening in the community. This is what I'll be talking about today. So you kind of see it's a grab bag. We're going to talk about uh, all of the APIs that are kind of accessing uh, our desktop and kind of reaching out from the browser to our other experiences. We're going to talk a little bit about the cloud and what that actually means to us as Ajax developers. We're going to talk all about what browsers are up to these days and how you know, Fire has kind of been lit up uh, under the browser vendors and we're doing uh, and seeing very exciting things with browsers. We're going to talk at the fun, uh, talk about the fun with different Ajax libraries and uh, what's going on there and making decisions based on what they're up to. We're going to play with some monkeys today. We're going to talk about Gears. Java's even going to make a surprise appearance as well as a Wii remote that we're going to use to wiggle things around and we're going to do some fun stuff. So with this state of Ajax, in the past, I've kind of got bogged down a little bit on like little details of what new JavaScript frameworks are up to. Uh, and you know, as developers and engineers, we can kind of you know, get pretty deep. But this time, I was kind of thinking about um, you know, what's really going on? Why did Ajax even matter? And uh, what does that mean for us as we start building these richer and richer web applications? And what I thought was kind of interesting was as I thought about how the whole Ajax term kicked off uh, with Jesse James Garrett, uh, he saw that through some of these things like Google Maps and Suggest and all these other early uh, Ajax applications that it represented a fundamental shift in what's possible on the web. And what's interesting to me about this is that it took a designer to actually tell us that. So as engineers, we knew about the XHR object and all these low level things, but we were kind of too much in the weeds. It took someone else to realize oh, this is cool because it enables you to do all this other stuff. It's not just cool technology. Uh, and we're seeing a whole bunch of new APIs that we'll talk about that are kind of going to allow us to make a similar leap in different ways as we saw with that little uh, XHR object. And again, if you think back, Google suggests, uh, back in the day, if someone uh, told me about this and you know, type something, you get instant output, you'd be like, no way, the web latency, it's too bad. There's no way that's going to work. And what Google Suggest did is it broke that myth. It broke that barrier and enabled us, the engineers, to be like, oh, yeah, we actually were totally wrong. And you can do things like this. You can make these little requests literally on a keystroke to do interesting things. So it kind of broke down one of the barriers. Google Maps, like Chris was saying, was kind of a wow moment. This was when the boss kind of came running in and said, hey, you said you couldn't do any of this stuff. And you kind of look back and get a little bit scared and when you think about how you actually have to do this. Um, but what I find interesting about Google Maps is that there wasn't actually much Ajax in there at the beginning. All of the stuff that your boss was, thought was cool was all of this dragging around and moving things. And that wasn't Ajax at all in the sense that it didn't use you know, the XHR object. All that's happening here is that we have a div that moves around and when it needs more images, it goes through and it grabs more images. And it just adds them to the DOM and puts them in the right place. It wasn't using Ajax at all. It's only some of the other things like getting data when you do a search and, and things like that that's actually using kind of what engineers think of as, as Ajax. So it's actually all about the user experience uh, is what actually mattered here. And this is the cool stuff. And the UI piece of getting that to work is actually not as complicated uh, as you may think if you haven't looked at it. 
And in fact, in Pragmatic Ajax, you know, way back, old book that worked on, we had a whole chapter on how you can build this from scratch in you know, a few hundred lines of code. It's actually not that hard. The hard stuff is the back-end uh, geocoding stuff. That's really hard. So what was so cool about the Ajax revolution wasn't that we've got this new object with these new methods. It was that we can build these more compelling user experiences. And this is what kind of changed the web um, for the first time in an interesting way. So we're going to talk a little bit uh, about that. Now, kind of apropos for being here in Germany, uh, when you're out you know, with a car, uh, how does it get advertised? It's this kind of stuff. It's the video of the car winding around the mountain, and you get this empathy towards this vehicle. You really want to sit in that seat. You want to feel it. That's what the end user, the guy buying the car, really cares about, not this thing. Right? And we're going to be talking a lot about that uh, today, and you know, App Engine, these other things, the low-level technology is really important. But I think it's also important to kind of take a step back and realize that end users don't necessarily care about that. That's our job to make it all run well, but what they care about is the user experience. As long as they put their foot on the accelerator and it goes fast, that's all they care about. You know, there's the odd people that care deep, but not most of our users. So this is what we really need to focus on, and this needs to be the direction when we build our Ajax apps, how is this nicer uh, for our end users? Now, another little uh, example of how user interface matters, this is an actor in Hollywood who I have a bit of an affinity to. You know, he's a little bit chubbier, uh, probably doesn't have as much luck with the uh, uh, ladies as this guy. But what's interesting about these two guys is <coughs> they're actually the same guy. And the left-hand side, uh, he had to put on some weight for a part in Hollywood. And what's cool is that the interface has changed, but the implementation is exactly the same. <laughs> right? He's a nice guy. He's the same guy in both pictures, but he probably would have a bit more luck with the barmaid in Oktoberfest uh, if he's dressed up over there on the right-hand side. So again, just to kind of reiterate, it's not about uh, everything that's going on internally. Uh, the interface is what matters a lot, and not just in the sexy way, but uh, in other ways. Because if you just go sexy, bad things can happen too. Right? <laughs> We've all seen the wow, the translucent, the things flashing around. Uh, that isn't going to make a compelling user experience. That's just going to make flashy things that move around. So it's not just about making something look good. Uh, it's actually much more uh, than just doing that. And if we look at uh, what's been written about this, it's all there for you. Right, so the Humane Interface, a seminal work from Jeff Raskin, who did the early Mac stuff and many other things, uh, talked about how the quality of software is all about the interaction, the way it feels, the way the gear shift feels to you as you're sitting in the car. That's the stuff that matters. It's not whether or not it's flashy and translucent. However, if that doesn't feel quite right, and you kind of feeling a bit awkward in that situation, you get poisoned, you get frustrated. And that's what happened, I think, with uh, the Vista example, is people got so frustrated with, you know, stop doing something, and a box comes up that says, you've been idle. Are you sure you want to be idle? Like, it's like, go away from me. And you get frustrated, and you don't want to use the system anymore. And so we want to kind of get past that and give people the uh, opposite experience uh, as well. So there's these kind of two worlds out there. There's the uh, Jakob Nielsen world of the interactive design that kind of says, you know, seductive user interfaces in like a pejorative, like, oh man, these things that look sexy, that's not what it's about. You need to have very basic, simple things. But that's not true as well. You need both of these. And one example is that uh, there was this ATM manufacturer that did a uh, uh, build an ATM with exactly the same user interface. One looked really nice and one was ugly as sin, and they did tests with users, and people thought that the one that looked and felt really nice was actually a lot faster and a lot nicer to use. Right? So there's bits of both uh, that we need to, need to work with. The visual design guys, they're the guys that look cool and have the good hair, and they think, you know, Jakob Nielsen's just a nerd, and then they start fighting about technology, and you know, all this kind of stuff goes on between these two groups, and hopefully we'll see some coming together, but um, it's kind of interesting right now that you know, we as developers need to worry about uh, both of these things. So the web didn't used to be a particularly beautiful place. I don't know if you like that Amazon example in the keynote, if you remember a web like this when it first came out. 
I, f I like this. I can do this. You know, I'm a developer. I can make something just as beautiful or ugly as this. And so it felt kind of good. I could just like start building stuff and whip it up and like I'm just as good as, as anyone out there. And I just love that animated fox. That's just the, the coolest little touch. But now, of course, the web looks more like this. And this is just a pure Ajax example. There's no flash. And what Apple is doing here is they're allowing you to feel more of the product. So you can't be in a store when you're you know, online, but with this experience, you can feel like you're closer to it. You can move it around, zoom in, see what's going on. And I would bet that if it's something you like, you're going to have a much better chance of actually uh, purchasing it, a much better chance to get your users to purchase it. So really thinking about how this experience is all matter. And another example from Apple, just showing that you know, this kind of uh, horizontal list box, uh, this case can actually be fairly difficult with desktop. Uh, this may be not be a built-in control to a lot of operating systems, but they saw a, a good reason to, to use something like this. So the world has totally changed from the little fox into this uh, you know, nice world uh, that Ajax allows to, to happen. And it's obvious, expectations change. If we look at other industries, the top grossing film in, in 57 is The Bridge Over the River Kwai. Uh, who's seen that movie? OK, a fair few. How many people think that this would be a blockbuster hit if it came out right now? Probably not. It's probably not going to make it, because it doesn't have the things that people expect uh, from films today, like Spider-Man with you know, great graphics and CGI and uh, you know, no plot, things like that. The gaming world. The guy on the top there used to be a really cool game. It was a great game, Pong. Like, Who cares that it's just a few sticks and a, a little yellow thing bouncing up and down? Uh, nowadays, though, the expectations have been changed. We expect this like real-world thing that looks just like a video and is massively multiplayer and, and everything else. So if that first guy came out uh, today, it you know, may work as a little mobile game, uh, but that's about it. Right? So expectations are changing, and of course, that's going to mean the same thing for the web. And what we thought with the original kind of MapQuest-style maps uh, of clicking around and every time refreshing the page, um, our expectations are changed now, and we, we expect things like Google Maps to be able to just drag it around. So expectations are changing for our users, and so we need to think about that as we build our Ajax apps. So the first wave of Ajax was all about just that, making uh, JavaScript a little bit better, helping a bit with the cross-browser stuff, giving us these little effects uh, to help us out. But the killer app was the responsiveness. And if you look at it, Helping with the effects now uh, is nicely given to us through a bunch of libraries. So at the top left, you've got jQuery user interface, which is fairly new on top of jQuery. Uh, ext.js is a nice way to build desktop-like uh, look and feels that are themed. Digit is something that works on top of Dojo. And then the granddaddy, uh, you know, the kind of, kind of father of this stuff, Scriptaculous, all gives you very simple ways to add the effects. Uh, so now you just have to think about where it makes sense for the user interface to do it. Here's an example of an uh, email application. This one happens to be done using Digit. There's, a, I think, in the GWT session, they'll show one with GWT. Uh, you can make very professional-looking uh, applications uh, in the web. And we're seeing you know, really cool stuff happen in there that we'll see, too. To do this kind of stuff, just a few examples. I'm going to randomly kind of show uh, different libraries. All of these can kind of be used in the various ones. Uh, here's an example with Dojo that allows you to tie it through CSS to a particular area. In this case, the navigation bar, looking at things that are focused. You can then change the tab index, style it a particular way uh, when you've hovered over or focused on it, and then animate between one color and another all in one line. So this stuff used to be really hard and really painful to do cross-browser. And now, thanks to these libraries, it's just they're available. You can just do it one line, bang. And jQuery really kind of innovated here and gave us a way uh, to actually do this very simply. But a lot of that stuff is fashion. I'm not here to talk about fashion. You can see what I'm wearing. I'm a developer. I'm not a designer. I don't know what's uh, going on there. Who knows? Rounded corners was the Web 2.0 thing. Maybe it's triangular corners next time. Uh, I don't know what's going on. But what you can work out is the interactions. And uh, here we're looking at Tadar list. And as we type something in and hit enter, we have the old yellow fade technique. 
And that's uh, showing us that something's happening because in this new world, we can't rely on the simple world of Web 1.0, which is the whole page refreshes, that's how you know something changes. We need to indicate different things uh, to our users as different things are changing on the screen. So we need to kind of really think about uh, what we're doing for the UI and then use these tools appropriately. Now, all of this stuff is kind of explained. Uh, Jakob Nielsen talked about how there's these basic rules that have been around for the last 30 years that we're kind of uh, learning again in the Ajax world. And the first one is that if you've got 0.1 second, that's going to be the limit for a user to feel like it's instantaneous. So they feel like they're really working with the system. Everything you do is coming back instantaneously. You're on a roll. You've got to do a certain task. You can do that task, and it just happens. If it gets to a second or above, that's when your mind does a complete context switch. So now all of a sudden you feel like you're out of the flow. And when you think about this, that's why you know, using MapQuest to do maps was more frustrating experience, trying to actually do any kind of business workflow on the web was painful because every time you did anything, you're going past this one second barrier. And so we need to build our app, especially when you're going through a certain flow, to do everything they can to get lower than that one second. And if you go in between 0.1 and 1, that's where you can kind of get away with it uh, just enough. So you just feel like it's uh, you know, response in, uh, responding in, in an adequate way. So we need to make things fast enough for our users to kind of stay in the flow for the things that they're doing. And so when you look at that, that's when you realize why this Ajax stuff was cool. Uh, this is kind of the example 101 of doing Ajax uh, the old way. You would go through, and you'd have a form, and you put in the zip code or postcode, and it's going to go out, retrieve the city and the state, and plug it in so your user doesn't have to do it. And it could do this asynchronously. It would do it as soon as you type in the zip code, and it would take that whole step away from the user. And so it gave it, us this responsiveness by being able to do it asynchronously from the browser, and it helped that particular workflow. Now, this uh, itself has gotten a lot easier. So in this case, using prototype, now by saying new Ajax request, it's going to go ahead and do that. And behind the scenes, it's actually doing a fair amount of work. It's making sure it's getting the right transport, depending on the browser. It's checking the right things to make sure it's successful or not. Uh, it's doing all these things that you don't have to do uh, to give you very, very easy remoting. So this problem was solved early on with Ajax and uh, is now kind of taken for granted uh, as us with developers as we kind of build our apps. We can do asynchronous stuff very easily just through a one-liner through our libraries. Now, we often get asked... Uh, through Ajaxian, you know, which library shall I use? And that's a really hard question uh, to just kind of generically ask. There's millions of libraries out there, and this is, you know, a dartboard showing some of them. Every day we get emailed with new libraries, and it kind of depends, obviously, on what you're doing. But just in general, it's really hard uh, to make that choice. There's just kind of a, this paradox of choice, which is similar to what we had in Java, uh, with the server-side web frameworks. It's almost a uh, frustrating uh, amount of choice. So these days, kind of the popular ones that we see, uh, something like this four, Dojo, GWT, Prototype and Scriptaculous, and jQuery. But then, you know, if you use YUI and things like that, they're great libraries too. I mentioned EXT. But we're kind of seeing a little bit of consolidation uh, around these libraries, which I think is only going to get more and more and is going to you know, be a very, very good thing for us because uh, we've got way too much fragmentation. Now, with these libraries, it used to be fairly easy to kind of explain what kind of one you may be looking at. If you want to do something simple like Tadar list and you just want to sprinkle a little bit of Ajax dust on your app, then Prototype is probably a really good tool for you. It's got simple remoting. It makes JavaScript nicer, cross-browser, but it doesn't try to do too much. On the other hand, if you're like a Java guy and you work in the enterprise in IT or something and you don't want to learn that JavaScript thing, then GWT would be a good choice for you because you could just stay in the land of Java and you get all of the benefits of debugging and cross-browser support uh, out of the box and you have really good performance. If you like the new DOM-centric approach with jQuery, you could uh, you know, obviously use that. And then if you were building some really heavy Ajax application, you could bring out the soup to nuts uh, solution, which was Dojo, which has everything in the kitchen sink in there. 
uh, for any kind of Ajax app that you're building. So it was somewhat easy uh, to make a choice based on kind of how rich your app was, how much stuff you wanted to do with it. But that's changed. And these days, it's actually a lot harder because the core of all of these libraries are all these kind of lean, mean little cores. So even Dojo has a very thin, you know, 20K-ish uh, core to it. And then they all have plugins that sit on top of that. And so we've got different plugin communities. Some are built in, some are extra uh, that sit on top for added functionality. And then finally, for the effect stuff, each library has effects in it on top of it. So it's a lot harder to make that choice because we've seen a lot of consolidation. The jQuery CSS stuff is now in all of these guys. So it's more kind of small, subtle things on what your app needs, features that a particular library has, a community that you kind of identify with uh, is what the choice is about. But also, it means if you make any of these choices that you're going to be just fine. There's great communities, great stuff going around uh, all of them. A few examples just, again, to kind of show what, what's going on here. Uh, here's an example that uh, will just tie into your mouse wheel. And the very first line is, again, doing a whole bunch of work for you. So when your page loads, uh, there's different stages of it getting loaded. And so once you've loaded the page and it's got a DOM object, uh, it's then going to go and download images and things like that. If you do an onload event, it's going to wait for the images to download before it kicks it off. So there's a new thing called DOM content loaded, which is that tree's ready for you. And this one line is going to take care of that across the browsers. So the ones that support the standard, DOM content loaded, it's going to work that way. For those that don't, it's going to use hacks uh, to give you the same effect. Later on there, as we bind the mouse wheel and check the different deltas, that's again using IE's event model for IE and the standard event model for other browsers. And it's going to have different fixes for different bugs in these browsers. So these libraries are giving you a high level of abstraction so you don't have to worry about all of the cross-browser issues that are so painful in web development. There's some new guys on the block that are really uh, interesting to look out for. Uh, again, kind of looking at an email application, this is where Apple came out with Mobile Me, which is their you know, web-based version of, uh, of the Apple system. Uh, this is the email piece of it. This is uh, an open source framework called Sprout Core, and it's a pure JavaScript MVC framework. So you build a model in JavaScript, and then you just talk to web services to get data, but you're building it more like a desktop app in JavaScript itself. And another app called Other Inbox just launched last week that uh, also uses Sprout Core. And you see these are really, really rich applications delivered in the browser. 280 Slides is another great one by these guys uh, in 280 North. These guys are like big Cocoa guys. They worked at Apple, and they wanted to be able to use that development environment but get the web's reach. And so they built this thing called Objective-J instead of Objective-C, and they built Cappuccino, which is their version of uh, Coco, and you build these apps just like you would build a, uh, a Mac app. So again, it's very much like a desktop application that you build, and it gives you things that would be unbelievably painful to do in normal Ajax land. So for example, uh, if you made a change to that slide that says welcome to 280 slides to something else, the little icon in the top left that's in yellow will automatically change because they're using SVG and just scaling down that image on the fly. And for them, that's one line of code observing the change and getting it in. But if we were to do that in just normal JavaScript and DHTML, it's going to be really painful to get that to work. So there's these things that you should look at. If you want to build a very rich desktop-looking uh, app, then you should take a peek at uh, some of this new technology that's out there. That just got open sourced uh, about two weeks ago. So you can start playing with. Uh, the Objective-J stuff. There's other cool rich stuff happening. This is a, a charting module. This is something that you know, Flash has traditionally been very good at. Ajax has traditionally been really bad at. This is a, an example using Dojo at real time, getting information uh, out, of a, out of a backend system using Comet or just polling. You, know, you tweak what's going on, and it's going to do this drawing automatically for you. Very rich charting component uh, and a few lines of code that you can set up. A real pain on the web has been just native components that you have. Right? It's crazy that we just have like an HTML table, and we don't have a rich grid that something like Flex and uh, desktop APIs have available. 
And now we're starting to see those. This is Dojo example again. EXT has a great grid. They're all starting to get them. So you can have these flexible experiences where it can go back asynchronously and grab new data and do interesting things. And then finally, there's this really cool example. Uh, notice how fast and clean all of this is. This is using Canvas. And uh, it's created by John Resig, the guy that did jQuery and works at Mozilla. And he implemented the processing language, which is a language to do visualizations, to JavaScript. And it actually runs really, really fast and allows you to do these amazing visualizations just writing uh, a bunch of JavaScript code. So it's really exciting to see the new things that are just kind of coming up that we can employ to give people uh, these great new experiences that weren't traditionally available before. To go into Canvas a little bit more, a few demos here just kind of showing the kind of stuff that you can do. Um, you know, full fake 3D stuff for games, image manipulation, all of this stuff runs really, really quick. Uh, it's this native API that we can just call upon. So if you need this very, very rich API to do this kind of stuff, uh, it's there for you uh, right now in the browsers. So it's, uh, it's a pretty exciting time uh, to start building these really rich, rich things on on open technology. So what is this Canvas thing? Uh, Canvas uses JavaScript as a JavaScript API. You make a call to say, give me a Canvas context. Uh, normally, it's a 2D context, but there's room in the future to have 3D uh, as well. And it's just a painting API that you use. So you render these commands, draw a line, draw a circle, you know, all these different things that you have available that you're used to if you've done any 2D kind of programming. And then the implementation keeps those commands. It's called retained mode. So it's there, and you offer these commands. And then it's going to do the repainting for you. And that's why it's really performant, because that repainting is all in C++ uh, done by the browser itself. And so when you want to change something, you then issue a new command uh, to paint something differently on the screen. And then in the next painting pass, it's going to then draw that for you. So this is what gives us this great performance. The browser's doing all of the actual uh, rendering, and you're just issuing these commands uh, to work with. Now, the elephant in the room with Canvas is, OK, it's native in Firefox and things like that, but what about IE? We want this to work across all of them. Uh, Chris Wilson, just last week at a browser panel, he's the uh, main group product manager for IE, said that uh, this is the next thing that they're going to be looking at. So hopefully, it's going to be native into IE soon. But there's bridges out there right now. Um, there's three. One of them does a bridge to VML, which is the native thing in IE. That's a thing called X Canvas. Uh, there's a flash bridge that comes with that and a new Silverlight one that they're working on. And there's even this really cool new thing from the Firefox guys. The guy that did the original Canvas implementation for uh, Firefox, he suddenly got the idea that was like, what if I take this Canvas code and I wrap, wrap it in an object tag for IE? And so then you can do a Canvas tag and have a JavaScript shim that changes it to an object tag. And then you get the native drawing through the same code that does the Canvas stuff in Firefox on IE. So a lot of people are working on you know, pushing IP, uh, IE to get it in there uh, by default and in interesting ways, uh, which allows you to actually, as developers, start building this stuff. So it's really exciting. Uh, I've been playing a lot with Canvas recently. It's incredibly fast, and it's uh, exciting to kind of think about these new visualizations. What about SVG? Uh, I got a question at this browser panel last week at Web 2.0, which was, how dead is SVG? Is it really dead, totally dead? Uh, interesting choice of question. Um, we're actually seeing uh, interesting things happen with SVG. So I mentioned that Canvas is this retained mode 2D drawing thing. SVG is uh, immediate mode. You have objects that you can then start moving around and you have actual ties into. The problem traditionally with SVG has been, again, getting it on all the browsers, but also um, it's painful to use because it's all of this XML stuff that fits in XHTML land, but not in HTML land. Uh, but recently, we got through the, those barriers. So you can now use SVG within a normal HTML page. So it's going to kind of open things up a bit. So if you need to be drawing shapes that you want to move around and interact with, uh, SVG can still uh, be an interesting choice. I favor the Canvas world. 
I think that that's more exciting at the moment, more interesting things, but uh, SVG can be a, a good option. So point 0.1 second is the limit for having a user feel that the uh, feedback is instantaneous. But we have a problem in our world of the browsers. So we've got a browser open, we start clicking around, we start typing things. That's all great. <coughs> But the problem with the browser is that it's out there and it's running all this JavaScript code, uh, which you've written in your app, and that JavaScript code is, is growing because we're building bigger and bigger Ajax apps. And that browser, at the same time, has to actually do all the web stuff. So when you're typing in, it has to put the keyboard stuff in there. So it's fighting with itself. And so we've got this bottleneck where the browser is kind of at odds with itself doing your code and dealing with the user at the same time. This is what Chris was talking about with responsiveness of the UI uh, in the keynote. Now, unfortunately, we can't just do what we would do in the desktop world, which is spawn a new thread, right? So we'd go out there and we'd just say, okay, let's do another background thread and it can run some code. But JavaScript has no notion of threading. So maybe in the future, Brendan Eich, the inventor of JavaScript, Maybe he'll add threading to the language, so we'll be able to do threading stuff. Well, he was asked that, and this was the title of the blog post that he wrote. So he's not a fan, shall we say. And this kind of says that maybe threading, uh, as we think about it, isn't going to get added to JavaScript. And he didn't say this just because he doesn't particularly, uh, you know, at a whim, doesn't like uh, threading. He doesn't like it because he he's seen that it has proven to be very painful in other worlds. Take Java, you know, the, with Java we've got all these new concurrency models all the time, trying to get, uh, get it so us as developers don't shoot ourselves in the foot constantly. And so Brendan doesn't want to go on that same path and give us this evil threading model that we're going to use uh, to screw up the browser. Okay, so no threading in JavaScript. What can we do? Well, this is where Gears comes in. This is where the worker pool stuff comes in. And what's actually happening there is that there's a very simple API, and you can think of these worker pools as these just little areas for JavaScript to run code. And what you do from your code in the browser is you say, hey, guy over there, run this code for me. And when you're done, you're going to send me a message back. So there's no shared state. So it's more like the Erlang model that people are talking about now. Uh, where you just go and send strings or JSON objects, and they just send them back, and you get all of these really nice side effects like security and things like this. But to take another look at uh, how this stuff actually matters, we'll take a peek at uh, this demo, and I'm going to kick this off just in the browser, and the thing that's moving left to right is showing the UI responsiveness again. And what I've just kicked off is an uh, algorithm that's working out prime numbers. And that gets exponentially hard as the numbers get higher. And you'll see that it starts chunking more and more. So that little Knight Rider guy that's going backwards and forwards is uh, chunking up. And we're seeing really bad UI responsiveness. And in the real world, this would be a user typing something. And it would stop taking the input. And then it would like flood in all of those letters. Uh, I'm sure you've seen that before. But if I stop that and I kick off, I can even do multiple versions of this, you'll notice that it's totally separate. That code's all being run over in this worker pool in a different process, and the UI, what the, what the user is actually uh, interacting with in the browser is still 100% uh, responsive and uh, available for the user to do things. And so that's why this stuff really matters. You know, with the original Ajax stuff, it gave us some new responsiveness. But now as we do more things, more Ajax, it uh, makes even bigger uh, impact. As we do more and more JavaScript that the browser has to run, we can push this stuff elsewhere. So if a feature is well designed, and we use it again and again and again, then we get into the habit uh, of using that, and we put that together, and we build these gestures. So we're used to doing something in Gmail that sets a label and puts it in the archive. You don't think about it anymore as a user. And it's this feature that becomes a bug in when we pop up a box for our users, and they have to say yes or no to something like, are you sure? Because we find that users just always hit yes. They don't think about it. That's what they're used to doing. It adds no security. So we need to think about 
different metaphors and different ways that we can kind of get across uh, what's going on. We need to think about these habits that users are into. So one thing that people will say about that is use undo rather than sending up these uh, warning dialogues. So, okay, how do you actually do that on the web? The web is like transactional where you'll do something and you'll go to another page and it's already done that transaction. So how can you undo what you, what you did before? You have to do extra coding to have you know, the calculation to be able to undo it or whatever's going on. It's very easy to uh, get that wrong. So there's other ways that you can think about this problem. So this is just one example of rethinking uh, UI on the web. Uh, kind of look to what Leopard gave us with its uh, backup story with Time Machine, and it gave us this new way to think about backups. I could literally visually see the history of my files on my machine as they did backups, and I can go back in time, and as I flip through this using the mouse wheel or what have you, suddenly I'm going to see, ah, oh, here's where the file was. And it shows up in that pane, and then I can drag it and move it back to the future. So how about if we do that on the web? And so I built a little example of this. This is the Gears version. There's also one that uses App Engine and saves it to the cloud. And what you do is you have your address book, say, and you go to uh, some history, and you'll notice here it says that there's a whole bunch of saved entries. So now I can go back in time in a primitive way with a slider, and I can get access to that. So now there's no notion of undo. If you happen to make a mistake, you can just go back one, edit and save, save it as that one again. But it also gives you new functionality. Uh, I've lived in every time zone in the States, and every time I do anything, the immigration people there say, what are the last five places you've lived? And I don't have this in the Apple address book, so I just have to like hide it in the notes section or, or whatever's going on. But if I had this as part of the UI, I'd feel a lot safer about making changes. I know my history is there. And so this is where we can start thinking a little bit differently and uh, offering users different experiences so they can then just go in, change this guy, save it, and now the history is just totally changed and ready for them to do stuff. So it's kind of fun to you know, start thinking as we think about, you know, this is the stuff that made Ajax important. We can start building these forms. We can save history state, go back in time, do interesting things, show it in different uh, UI formats for uh, stuff that our users are using. OK. Jonathan Schwartz, the CEO of Sun, he has to sell hardware. And uh, he's like, OK, it's great, this rich internet app thing. That's really cool. Uh, but what about the back end? You still need to do stuff on the server. It's not going to just entirely be uh, a client application in Ajax. You're going to have to save stuff and do things on the server. So what about the ribs, the rich internet back ends? What are you doing uh, in that area? And it's interesting to me because finally, as we've got these rich Ajax apps, web services make sense again. Not in the WS star kind of clunky soap, big heavy things, but in lightweight little things. Like the zip code example at the beginning, in the old days I'd have to download a zip code database, I'd have an API to that database, I'd have to manage new versions as they came in. Now there's something, this one happens to be up on App Engine, there's an API where you pass it a zip code and it gives you the city and the state. And for my Ajax app, I can just have one little component that talks back to that service. This guy Mike Chambers from Adobe, the day that we launched App Engine, I happened to be uh, here, I actually happened to be in uh, Munich talking with the uh, Adobe guys there, and he built a little <coughs> thing in Python that he used to run on the command line, he threw it up on the web, you type in some source code, and then it beautifies it and gives it nicely to you. And then at Google, we have a whole slew of these uh, interesting APIs. This is one example, the translation API. And so I added a little uh, script, a little bookmarklet, and a grease monkey script to Twitter so I can highlight anything. It detects the language and then translates it uh, back to English, in my case, for me. And I can push that all off to Google. And even if the, the translations are kind of so-so, I know that in the future, it's only going to get better. So we can start pushing off stuff that we don't need to do. We can build little compartments. And finally, web services don't make sense. 
all of the web framework stuff we were doing before was just doing a bunch of stuff and packaging it together. Now, with these rich Ajax apps, we don't have to do that. We can separate it. And fortunately, with you know, App Engine, Amazon, uh, App Tanner's got a meta cloud. There's a whole slew of these guys coming out. We could just easily throw these different services up on a cloud and start calling into them uh, from JavaScript, which is pretty exciting. What about the desktop? Our users want to integrate more and more uh, with the desktop. I want to, when I'm in uh, a web application that has to do with email notifications, I want it to use the system notification uh, that, that's on my particular operating system. So on the Mac, I want it to use Growl to let me know when something is happening. It's nice to have badges on the different icons to kind of give me meta information on what's going on. My address book, I would like the website to tie into my address book in a certain way, and a similar thing for calendar and events. So we want to tie into the user's world in different ways, and we're able to do that uh, with different technology sets. So you know, I'm going to be talking a lot about Gears, which is about adding stuff to the browser, but there's other interesting technologies too, like Adobe Air, which is all about building desktop apps. You just happen to use web technology. Uh, for it, which a lot of people know. One that isn't mentioned uh, as frequently is Fluid, and uh, Fluid is this really cool Mac-only system that gives you a single site browser, and then if you're writing JavaScript Ajax code, you get these new uh, objects that you can use. So you get a new Growl object, and you say growl.notify, and it would tie into that system. So you can build these rich uh, systems on different operating systems. Prism is like Fluid, but it's you know, cross-browser that we can tie into to integrate closer and give us really, really nice functionality, even in a way where I can build stuff for myself and put it out there as a grease monkey script and people can start using it. So if you're in something you use every day, you can uh, enhance it and make it really cool for you. Another kind of usage, taking the uh, dartboard from before, this is my partner in crime, Ben Galbraith, and together we built this little Wii game that allows us to choose an Ajax library by literally throwing a dart, which is just as good as way as, uh, as, as any way else. And this is just a pure Ajax app uh, that we're talking to from the uh, Wii control. So he's you know, moving that controller around. When he pushes down on a button and then does the motion to throw a dart, it's then going to throw it. And depending on how fast he throws it, how straight and how, you know, out of direction is going to throw it in different ways. So how do we actually do that? How do we tie into something native like a, a Wii controller? So first of all, the Wii speaks Bluetooth, which then talks to your operating system. And then there's a library called Wii Use that gives you a high-level API into things like he's pushing down button A, or he's moving it in this direction, and things like that. And there's a Java version that uh, gives you access to all of that stuff. And so we just wrote a state machine, so that we track is the first bit of code that we had to write, that just stores that information, the position you're in, all the things that you're doing. And then an applet is there just to surface that information. But then most of the code was actually all written in the browser. The whole game logic was written in JavaScript, and we could just say, document, get element by ID, name of the Wii applet, and now we can say, did it fire, what's its location, go ahead and see it move, and then moving it all on the screen. And so this, for us, was just an experiment to kind of see how, else, how further can we kind of take things? What other devices can we tie directly in the web? What new barriers can we kind of break for web applications? And it's kind of exciting to see uh, the state of these Ajax stuff kind of progress so we can really tie into this stuff. And we use Java, and people kind of make fun of Java. They say, oh, remember those crappy applets that are really slow and would like slow down the whole browser and things like that? The latest Java plugin is actually pretty interesting, and it ships uh, with Chrome by default. And it's now out of process, which fits into the whole Chrome model. Uh, deployment is very easy. You can do things like, I run uh, this version of JRuby uh, in the client. As soon as you install it once, it's there uh, all the time, and the JDK is really small. So it's really interesting to see Java actually become pretty decent. We'll see what actually happens and uh, if it gets any traction. But it's kind of really interesting. Another way to tie into uh, the system is using Java not to draw things on the screen, 
but as a way to bridge into uh, the native systems. So what about the future? As much as I love web stuff, I understand how true this graph is. It's painful. We all know it's painful. It's really painful. I have nightmares mucking around with CSS, getting it to work in different browsers. It looks great here. It's 10 pixels off. Do I really go and understand the box model and do it correct? No. I just keep adding a few pixels, and then it looks right, and then I'm OK. So you never know really what's going on. And so we have this you know, real problem in the open web stack that we need better tools and we need more things to kind of help us break through uh, this barrier. So we've got some interesting stuff happening. CSS animations that WebKit kind of got out there, the Apple guys and now Firefox uh, is shipping too. Really functional, useful stuff like spinning things around. What's cool about this stuff is that you don't even need to use Scriptaculous and those things to do effects. They had the really smart idea, which is this SVG thing can do all of this cool stuff. No one's using it. What if we surface it as simple uh, declarations uh, within CSS? And so we can see here on the uh, example there, you can just do a dash WebKit transform and do these different things, move it around, ease it in in different ways. And one line of CSS, it does all of these cool effects for us. And we don't even have to go down into libraries to make this stuff happen. And then the libraries can also abstract it uh, on top of this for us. Same thing for like reflections. Rather than having to do this using Canvas natively uh, or go through and actually you know, do a bunch of stuff in JavaScript, you can go through like there, build a mask, apply it to the image, boom, you've got your effect. If the browser doesn't implement that, that's fine. It will just get the, uh, the uh, old picture. Right? And we're seeing that with things like rounded corners. If you use Twitter, you now get nice rounded corners if you have a browser like this that supports it. And you can even tie into SVG shapes like this and do all this crazy stuff just through uh, simple CSS. So CSS is giving us and surfacing uh, a lot of these interesting things in very trivial ways for us to use as actual developers. And that's kudos to Apple for making that happen. The coolest thing is JavaScript performance. So Squirrelfish came out and was a lot faster. Just a few days ago, it came out with Squirrelfish Extreme. And it's got to have the best logo of, of anything I've ever seen, I think. <coughs> Almost as good as a little fox. Um, that got really fast. And then, of course, with Chrome, with Google Chrome, when that came out, we've got V8, which is another open source engine. And at the same time, Mozilla took uh, Tamarin, the thing that Adobe uh, gave to them and created TraceMonkey and added trace-based trace jitting. And the end result of all of this stuff is that we went from really painful, bad JavaScript uh, interpreters to state-of-the-art, very, very fast JavaScript runtimes. And this matters in apps like Gmail and rich apps. And it matters with using Canvas, where you have to do computations. And so we've gone from kind of the, the poor guy on the block that's like looking up to the Java VM and the CLR and now, actually, we've got things that are really friggin' fast. And this is awesome for us. This is going to bring in a whole new set of possibilities as we get magnitudes faster in what we're doing. The only issue is we need the browsers to do other things. And we're starting to see that. We care about fast JavaScript, but what about DOM manipulation? As soon as you go into DOM, you get dead slow. So we need them to kind of innovate there and give us performance uh, within the DOM and other browser areas as well. But it's really, really an exciting time to see these guys innovate and kind of leapfrog each other. And uh, yeah, as a Google guy, I love TraceMonkey and Squirrelfish because then we can like beat up on the V8 guys and make them get going faster and faster. And it's just, yeah, it's awesome. Mozilla has some other monkeys. For some reason, they love monkeys. Uh, Screaming Monkey is a way to get the really fast uh, JavaScript into IE. So it's there as a backdoor if the IE team doesn't uh, do anything good uh, with new versions and just focus on Silverlight. And uh, Iron Monkey is a monkey that allows you to write Python code as well as JavaScript within the browser. So Mozilla's doing some interesting uh, fringe research with their monkeys. And the browsers kind of get to break out of the pen, and now with Chrome, 
and start learning new tricks, do cool new things, and kind of move the whole web forward for the, the first time in quite some time. Gears is all about updating the web. The reason that it happened was that there was a group at Google that was building web applications that wanted new functionality, and as web developers, the browser platform wouldn't give it to us. So we started to build things that <coughs> had to work across all the different browsers, and we wanted to kind of speed up the innovation on the web. It was too long in between new versions, and as people that build on top of this platform, we needed it to run faster. What's been interesting has been able to see how Gears and HTML5 work together. So this is a you know, very exciting standard. And what's happening here with the zipper analogy is that you know, Gears came out first with a bunch of APIs. They've now been standardized or starting to be standardized or going to be depending on uh, the maturity of the API. And as time goes on, that zipper is going to go up. And Gears is going to start implementing uh, and already is, in some cases, the standard APIs as they get firmed up. And so the whole reason for Gears is to be this other leg to the stool so we don't run into a situation where we have all of these amazing APIs, but just because one browser doesn't implement it, we as developers feel like we can't use it because that whole set of users aren't going to be able to do it. Gears is here to make sure that even if a particular browser doesn't implement that, the functionality is there uh, through a plugin. And our philosophy is to be a hard-nosed implementation of these APIs, running fast, trying out new things, and then moving over to HTML5 and getting the standards in there uh, into the browser. If the browsers implement all this stuff and you don't need gears, that's a huge win for us. We just want the functionality, and this is our way to kind of push it out there uh, as a hedge you know, compared to Chrome. HTML5 itself is a huge spec that really changes the game and gives you all of this stuff that you know, should have been there a long time ago. Instead of having to do a date picker, wouldn't it be nice to just say input type equals date and have a really nice native date picker that's available? Yeah, kind of a no-brainer. You've got that select box that's you know, select, but then you've got other, and then you have to type it in. Wouldn't it be nice to have a combo box that you can just type in? All of these different uh, widgets and components we're finally getting. Type equals email, just validate it for me. Uh, don't have me do all this crazy stuff. So we're getting a whole bunch of new things like that. Video and audio and Canvas are already in browsers kind of uh, today, early on. And then we've got new things coming along. Uh, post message gives us a way to kind of talk between tabs and uh, event systems and things like that. Native drag and drop. This is going to be a huge thing uh, when it starts to get in, and it's already trickling in. So it's not going to be like one big bang. It's going to be constantly we're going to start seeing new APIs uh, that get added to it. And it's, you know, as a, as a web guy, it's, it's really exciting stuff. What about the mobile web? Here's an application on the iPhone called Spin the Bottle. And to me, this looks like a native app that could be in the App Store. Uh, in this instance, it's actually a Canvas uh, game that runs anywhere. And so it has the added advantage that if Apple gets into the Spin the Bottle business, they're not going to kick you out of the App Store because uh, you're just a web page and just native canvas. That's going to work in any browser. It works in the mobile world. And so we got this new frontier of mobile stuff and like pushing out this stuff using the same skills that you have to build Ajax applications, you can now put onto the mobile world. So the Android guys will go talking about Java and, and that's great. Uh, but I like building Ajax apps. I want to get reach uh, in that kind of way. And so it's Amazing to see iPhone kind of push this forward, and then now Android has WebKit and given us the same kind of capabilities. It's kind of showing that mobile users want the full internet. They don't want WAP and WML and you know, crappy interfaces. They want the full thing, and that allows us as web developers to kind of build these rich apps that also reach uh, that audience. So the mobile web uh, is just kind of getting started and uh, is another place for us to get excited about. So again, to kind of take a step back at the universe that is Ajax, we've got this very easy programming model with libraries that help us make it even easier across browser. Very trivial to just do remoting to talk back to our backend web services. You can customize it in ways that desktop guys you know, couldn't dream of. Right? I can go through and personally change Amazon to show me whether the book is at the library down the street. 
Like what other application frameworks can you do that? Right? You can customize it all these different vectors. Browser plugins, gears, grease monkey, you name it, you can plug in at these different areas. You know, unparalleled deployment model, web reach, you're not downloading an app, you're just going to a URL. We're getting great widget systems out there now uh, through these different libraries. HTML5 is going to give us a bunch of native ones. Amazing FX through the new CSS stuff and Scriptaculous and those libraries. Mobile Story uh, is getting increasingly interesting all the time. We get integration into more desktop apps. And we have state-of-the-art plugins. And we even have job security. Uh, I don't know if you can see this, but there's a TV show called Stargate. It's a sci-fi show in the US. I don't know if you have it. But if you did a uh, pause uh, in one of the episodes and you zoomed into one of the computer consoles, uh, you'll see that this is actually JavaScript code. And this is from the year 2525. <laughs> and so keep writing JavaScript code, and you've got full job security. And when I was talking with the Adobe guys, I pointed out it's not ActionScript. It's not JavaScript 2. It's you know, good old JavaScript code. And so it's you know, an exciting time to start building this stuff. We had a winter for 10 years where browsers were doing nothing. We suddenly got to see the beauty of the winter through Ajax and XHR and had to do all these hacks to do interesting things. And we finally get the summer to kind of let us go out and build great applications. And thanks so much for hearing my talk. So I don't know if anyone wants to ask any questions about this stuff, Gears, Open Web, Google, what have you. Um, feel free to ask anything you want, and I'll do my best to answer it. So if there are any questions out there. Yes. Can you get the slides? Yeah. So uh, I'll put these up on uh, slide share and things like that, and I think the Google people put it online on the, uh, on the website and stuff. So, yep, you'll be able to get the slides. Anything else? Oh, what, what framework do I prefer personally? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, if this is the Google hat, I have to say GWT, but I'll let you into a secret. I don't like Java to do that kind of programming. So. Uh, I, I do other stuff. But uh, it really does depend on what I'm doing. When I'm doing like simple little examples, uh, then I like prototype or jQuery. Very simple, easy to use. If I'm doing bigger things in the past, I have used like Dojo uh, to do things like that. If I wanted to build a new desktop app that's uh, incredibly rich, that's where I look to some of the new things like Sprout Core is really cool. So it depends on what you're building and kind of what community you fall into. But 90% of the time, I'm a prototype jQuery small thing just to help me out kind of guy. What about jmucky? jmucky is another one of the hundreds of great frameworks that are out there. And uh, it does a very nice job at abstracting on top of the others and allows you to talk between the different systems. So yeah, it's a great framework. You don't need to, you could choose jmucky and then use all of them <laughs> and talk to them, yeah. And it solves a real problem, which is, uh, I find really frustrating, which is, I'm building a new app, I see this really cool date control, I see this other really cool slider control, and they both use two different libraries. So this one's a prototype one, this one's a dojo one, it's really frustrating, and jmucky helps at being able to kind of tie these things together, and uh, it's definitely a big problem in the Ajax space in general. So yeah, jmucky is a good choice. Okay, well, feel free to grab me anytime. I'm wearing the obligatory blue shirt. And uh, if you want to hear more about Gears and go through all the APIs, I'll be talking about that later. And uh, thanks again. Have a nice break. <laughs>